Our track will be extended 280 on the bottom of our high bridge. A lot of people wonder why we don't have this bridge. We actually do this for one reason and one reason only. Give our passengers a ride over the entire North Carolina Railroad. If we go under the bridge, we do what we call the Reason on or Complete the Loop. If we were to go to Silver Loop or anything on the Double Chief Station, we'd be known as the North Carolina Wiggly Line. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful. So, we'll pass down to the East of the Bridge, we'll complete the Loop the Railroad is paid for, and if you can see it in the opposite direction of the Silver Loop. Now, as we go under the bridge here, allow me to tell you about it. The original bridge was constructed in 1883 and 1884 at a cost of $250,000. Quite a sum of money in the 19th century. However, that bridge was torn down in 1939 and sold for scrap for a whopping $600. Not a very good return on their investment. This construction began before you was built in 1983 and 1984, 100 years after the original, at a cost of $1 million. Very glad we have the reconstructed bridge because old railroaders who had the original bridge would sag in the middle and sway from side to side and place with profit. I can assure you our bridge does not sag, will not sway with me profit. Otherwise, I know I would be riding on this train today. The most point of the speed under the bridge here is make a brief stop smaller as you hear the bridge take up top hill. We really hope he bridges to a stop soon now. This year in about 200 feet, we run out of breath. We will now begin our ascent to Silver Blue on the ride up. Like let Locomotive 1934 do the talking, so I will be stepping off the microphone. However, a member of the crew will be back on the as we arrive at Silver Blue. Now, on our ascent, I do have one request. Please have your tickets out ready, and and I will be around to validate them. So, once again, please have your tickets available for the train crew, and we'll be around to validate them. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you aboard the Georgia County.
I am very sorry for the interruption. However, I do have to say that if there's anyone on board the train that doesn't have a ticket, this is the part of the ride where I need to get off of my train.
binder. For those of you that have the bind tour, it's not the bind tour stop. So if you do want that to do that bind tour, let's just get back on board the train for 1040. Exactly. Gentlemen, welcome to Silverwood, Colorado. Elevation is 9,178 feet. Right, that train all the way up over the North Mountain. How does it get to Silver Plate? 
Yeah, that put the white open tail to make a shot. The R Railroad, like the original TDNL, is narrow gauge. The rails are the easiest part. Most railroads in the United States, like the Pacific and CNSF, use the standard gauge. The rails are more unique traffic in the parts. This leads to a narrow gauge system, which is the most common in the United States. Most of the rails are used for mountain railroads, but the rails are short for the same way that the ones working on now. Well, the rails are short for the same way that the ones working on now. Grade. We are now entering the senior executive portion of the line. It is known as the ladder track in the 1970s, 4% grade. This means for everyone with a travel will be dropped for beach elevation. That might not be <laughs> However, this seat the locomotive 1934 is about 12 feet lower than the car at the opposite end of the train. As we descend down the ladder track, you see that we are entering a field of giant boulders. When the railroad was being built, there was no machinery to move these boulders out of the way. They therefore had these hand drills packed with black powder and blasted in pieces that were small enough to be moved by their hands or by horse. Now, who do you suppose had the honor of lighting the fuse on all that powder and then getting out of the way? Well, of course, only mom and dad dialed up. Children. Children with the age of 7 and 14 were employed by the railroad and known as powder monkeys. Powder monkeys were made away to between 50 and 75 cents a day for their natural predictability. The ability to light the fuse and burn away before it's being ready to be raining down upon them. So, kids, you remember that the next time you're trying to actually go grab your room, there are far worse things that you have to do with insects. So, I can say you're going to leave. Here in just a moment, we're going to cross Cedar Street for the first of four times on our descent from Silver Cliff. As we cross to the bridge, you might get a good use of a clear tight waterfall. I try to keep that on the
silver blue. Silver formed with a type of lead known as Galena, which has that grand purple tint to it. Now, when the highway department was blasting away the mountain to build the interstate, they found several veins of silver. The only problem is that this silver is of such low quality, you're going to spend more money taking it out of the mountain than it actually works. Our train is now entering the clearing of the site of the Hall Tunnel. The Hall Tunnel was built in 1886 to be a transportation tunnel through Leavenworth Mountain off to our right, so that the silver ore that was on the south side of the train could be brought through the tunnel and then loaded here onto the train. Now, as they were taking the Hall Tunnel, they had the most unfortunate stroke of luck. They ran into the richest vein of silver ever discovered in the Canyon. That silver causes the loot to just in the tunnel and to start finding instead. As we pass the site, if you look off to the clearing on the right hand side of the train, you can see some pieces of our historic rolling stock collection from the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad. As we get further into the clearing, you'll see that our train is passing over a stone line trench. That trench is the entrance to the Hall Tunnel. Although it's unclear how much silver the Hall is over its site stand, it must have been extremely profitable. For the mine outlasted the repeal of the Sherman Silver Merchant Act, it outlasted World War I, outlasted the Great Depression, and even outlasted the abandonment of the railroad. The Hall Tunnel finally shut its doors for good in March of 1942. Oh, 
In the world of brute engineering, the double gate hybrid is pretty unique. 300 feet long, the same length as an American football field. However, what makes the bridge so unique is that before the winter of 1883, no railroad even thought it would be possible to build an iron bridge that was on both a curve and a grade. The engineering practice is defined to be that it could be done. However, defying all of the odds, the double gate hybrid was the first iron railroad bridge the entire world to accomplish growth. So, the bridge lies on a 19 and a half degree curve, and the lower line work level is at a rate of 50%. The size of the unit ended on is higher than the size of the entry combo. Back with the bridge was being built in the Indian Sea, the fourth stack is three separate attempts for building. The first time the bridge was completed in September of 1883, they discovered to their horror that the entire bridge was built backwards. So, they had to be constructed and rebuilt. It ended up being a three month job at the start of winter. The second time the bridge was completed in November of 1883, large sections were condemned by the inspector for improper riveting. Once again, the bridge was constructed and rebuilt. As the old saying goes, the third time was the charm. The third bridge was finally completed in the spring of 1884. The first bridge, or the first train was able to cross the bridge on April 28th of 1884. Now, those men that constructed that original bridge are historical proofs that men do not follow directions. The locomotive that is pulling our train today is the Georgetown Loop Railroad number 1934. 1934 was built in 1951 by General Electric as a standard gauge 80-ton diesel electric switch locomotive, originally purchased by the United States Navy. The Georgetown Loop acquired the 1934 in 2017 and had it converted to narrow gauge and have been operating here ever since. For those of you riding in the new steel parlor cars, those were once coach cars on the White Pass and Yukon Railroad in the 1960s. 70s. For those of you who see Cabo Club Car, that was what they coached car on the Lake Cabo Railway Transportation Company in California. For those of you riding in the yellow coach car, these were once freight cars that came from a hodgepodge railroad, including the Denver Zero Grand Western, the White Pass Yukon, the West Side Lumber Company, and even the Colorado and Southern right here in this very end. Here in just a moment, you're going to hear a nationally recognized railroad signal. It will signify a railroad crossing and consists of two long or one short and another long blast of the whistle. This is also Morse code for letter Q. You're probably wondering, what does this Q have to do with railroad? Well, the answer to that is not much. The signal dates back to the beginning of the train. Train who to have Queen Victoria on board the signal letter Q to other vessels to let them know that they have the Queen and therefore have the right of way. We adopted this single here in the United States not to indicate any form of monarchy, but to show that trains always carry the right of way. So if you're ever waiting at a railroad crossing, did you hear two long, one short, and another long blast of a horn or a whistle? The make is one stop, look, and listen, because that train is not going to be stopping for you.
already, ladies and gentlemen. We are now beginning our safe approach back to Devil's Gate. I'm going to be getting our microphone onto our break this is just telling you that we'll take very good care of you for the last couple of minutes of the train ride. Now, on my behalf, I'd like to thank you all for riding with me.